dance friends, and welcome to a special holiday episode of the Dance Edit Podcast. I'm Margaret Fuhrer, and it's just me this week. My co-hosts are getting a much-deserved break. So without them around, rather than doing our usual news roundtable discussion for this episode and also for next week's episode, I've put together a little Dance Edit Best of 2021 retrospective. And this isn't a best of the news roundup. Instead, it's a look back at some of our favorite interview moments from 2021, because over the course of the year, I've had some really illuminating conversations with dozens of the dance artists who are shaping the headlines, dancers, choreographers, directors, administrators, educators, all of the above. So some of the clips I'll play during these year-end specials are from the interviews that we used to air at the end of each regular episode. We did that up until the summer of this year. So those might be nice walks down memory lane for you. But other clips are from our new premium interview series, The Dance Edit Extra, which launched in the fall on Apple Podcasts. And for those of you who aren't already Edit Extra subscribers, well, these excerpts are a little holiday gifts to you. So we hope they'll entice you to head over to Apple Podcasts and find out what the Dance Edit Extra is all about. All right, so let's get right to the first clip. We are starting things off with the one and only Martha Nichols, a choreographer and dancer who's worked all over both the concert and the commercial worlds, whose interview aired in episode 51. That was back in February. She is incredibly thoughtful and purposeful in both her movements and her words, which is why this excerpt seems like the perfect bit of her interview to highlight. Here's Martha talking about dance as a language and how we use that language to communicate. Can you talk about the why of your creative process when you're when you're making things, especially dance things? Mm-hmm. What is it that drives you? Mm. Um, I would say on a presentational front, um, always the balance of the message and the music from a purpose, yeah, through a purposeful perspective, definitely the message, the intentionality, and the experience. Um, I firmly believe that if dance is a language, Everything we use while I create is me speaking. So what am I actually saying? And if I don't know what I'm saying, then I won't continue. <laughs> um, so my friends actually laugh about it where I'm like, I have to cancel rehearsal. Like, or you can all go home, but I'm just going to stand in the studio and figure it out. Um, yeah, so I definitely, the, the, the message, the experience, the spirit of it all, all of that definitely is heavily important to me. This idea of dance as a language, I feel like because language is increasingly and the way that we use language is so important and people are increasingly aware of that. Can you Mm -hmm. talk about that a little bit more in a dance context? Absolutely. I feel that every, uh, everything I create, I see it as and like not from an egotistical standpoint, but from an um, from a creative and uh, existing standpoint, I see it as a contribution. And so, what my question to myself is always: What am I contributing? So I'm creating this piece. Why am I doing it? And what am I saying? Um, of course, the boundary lies within. I can be. I am responsible for my level of clarity. I'm not responsible for the style of comprehension for those who are receiving whatever it is I'm I'm contributing, Mm -hmm. Um, but I am responsible for my level of clarity. Um, And so, yeah, if if it is a language and I do believe it is a language, um, my mother taught me that words, well, I was raised to believe that words either build or destroy. And so I never wanna destroy, even if it's unintentionally. Um, unless I think it's something that needs to be just completely demolished, <laughs> then I'm coming swinging. But as far as like a healing and an offering, a giving, um, an enhancement standpoint, dance is a language. And so I always am accountable to what it is that I'm saying. Um, 
whether it's through movement, through spirit, through music, through staging, through costume, through lighting, through direction, I'm speaking on every level. And it is my responsibility to make sure that um, every aspect isn't necessarily on the same note, but it is in the same chord so that when it all comes together, there is this beautiful sense of harmony. Creating beautiful dance harmonies. That's what Martha does. How wonderful is that? All right. So next up, we have the just terrifyingly smart Chloe Angel, whom I spoke with in episode 61. She's the author of the recently released book Turning Point, which gets into ballet's many ailments in a way that manages to be both damning and hopeful at the same time. And Chloe is a journalist who also has a degree in sociology. So while her book covers a lot of the ballet is broken territory that's pretty familiar to those of us already immersed in the dance world, she's also able to unpack and explain those issues from a different perspective. Here she is discussing all of that. You also studied sociology, and so you bring this sociologist's perspective to ballet. And I think that's something that doesn't happen enough. Um, what does that particular lens reveal that journalists and historians and other dance writers and dance people might miss? A ballet is absolutely ripe for sociological analysis. I mean, it's a sociology is the study of people in groups and dance is a, it's its own world. It's its own culture with its own, literally with its own language, with its own rules, with its, with a very particular power structure. Um, and uh, it is sort of, it almost cries out for translation, um, not only for people who are outside of it so they can understand this fairly insular world, but also for people who grew up in it. Mm -hmm. This is just how the world works. And then once you ha are able to step outside of it and have someone explain to you, well, this is, a, you know, this is what the power structure looks like. And, and this is why, you know, these rules are set up the way they are you come to understand yourself and your own experiences in that world differently um, once you can step outside of it and sort of, and, and have that explained to you rather than, well, this is just how the world works. This is how it's been since I was four and I don't know any different. Yeah. And I think that's where a lot of our listeners are. It's just, they have grown up inside this world and have internalized a lot of the dysfunction within it to the point that it just it take it for granted. It's just the way things are. And I, I felt that way as well. And um, one of the things that was most surprising was even as someone who I wasn't a serious ballet student, you know, I'm very upfront about this in the book. I was not a serious ballet student. I was never pre-professional or professional material. I did ballet. Um, I was on point for a couple of years and then I just did it as sort of maintenance technique for everything else that I was doing. But even I managed to internalize a lot of that dysfunction and, and to see it as normal. Mm -hmm. And um, I thought I was sort of free of that by the time it came to write this book. And then I would repeatedly have this experience of interviewing someone for the book, you know, a dancer who was talking about dancing on an injury or um, a narcissistic director who was talking about dismissing dancers who were too big for his liking. And in the moment I would listen to their explanation and I would sort of nod and empathize and I would think, yeah, I can rationalize that. That makes sense. And then I would, you know, send that chapter to my editor or I'd go out to the kitchen and tell my fiance about it. And they'd be like, that's awful. Mm -hmm. And I'd be like, oh, my ballet brain took over, you know, my, my sort of, my internalized ballet logic took over for a sec there. And, um, you know, I think this book is going to teach people who don't know a lot about ballet. They're going to learn a lot, but I also hope that, um, people who do know a lot about ballet, um, and have sort of practice spend a lot of their lives explaining away some of the things that are wrong with it we'll be able to see it all in one place and then step back and think that doesn't look right next on the docket today we've got sydney l mosley who when i say she's a multi-hyphenate talent i mean 
multi-hyphenate. She is an artist activist, an educator, and a writer, and she is a prominent voice in each of those spheres. During the pandemic, I think a lot of us have found a lot of solace in Sydney's words, in particular, in the writing that she's been doing for Essence and for Dance Magazine and the Brooklyn Rail, which is always incisive and lyrical and just revelatory. So here's Sydney talking about one piece that struck a particular nerve with thousands of Dance Magazine readers, and also talking about how her collective SLM Dances has coped during the pandemic. You recently wrote a piece for Dance Magazine about why you're waiting for the pandemic to end to produce a performance, and about how dance artists should give themselves permission to rest right now. And you expressed feelings that clearly resonated with people. A lot of people are feeling these kinds of feelings. How did you put words around those feelings? What's the what's the story behind that piece? Um, I think I was feeling a bit frustrated um, in a lot of different ways. I felt like as soon as the pandemic hit, uh, we got smacked with all of these online dance classes and online performances, people trying to figure out how to salvage what they were planning to present in uh, real time and real space to the virtual space. Um, people were like grieving because all of a sudden all their work was lost. There was all these things happening and it felt like no one had taken a beat. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> Um, to process what was happening and to be just be present with that. Um, it just felt like people felt the need to continue this go, 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 when clearly the <clears throat> powers that be were asking us to take a moment and stop and rest. Um, even, you know, I remember those first few weeks of the shutdown and they were getting all of these environmental reports about like how the dolphins were swimming yeah. again, and, like, like the happy. trees were regenerating. <laughs> and it was like, oh, because people stopped and they stopped polluting the air. <laughs> yeah. So um, I, I was definitely feeling a frustration around that. And I, you know, I think, um, the energy in the dance field has gone up and down since then in terms of how much people have chosen to engage or not engage. But I still feel this overwhelming like push, push, push to reopen, push, push, push to keep producing, push, push, push. And I'm not sure that what people are pushing for is actually in alignment with what they really need or is in alignment with their artistic practice. It just feels like pushing for the sake of pushing, um, which is unnecessary. Mm -hmm. So leading a dance collective, I mean, figuring out how to keep not only yourself, but also your creative partners activated and inspired and most critically paid. It's hard enough in the before times, before COVID changed everything. How have you approached that work during the past year? with COVID as this huge additional stressor? How, how has dealing with the pandemic changed you maybe as a leader? Um, the pandemic actually has not changed me as a leader. Mm -hmm. It actually has fortified me and affirmed me as a leader um, in a lot of different ways. One is that <clears throat> This year, I realized that, oh, I actually built a container that could withstand crisis. Mm -hmm. um, and part of that is because we've never had a lot to start with. You know, we, we have had very few monetary resources over the past uh, almost 11 years now of making work. And um, so the fact that we figured out a way to may uh what i want to say sustain one another and to sustain our relationships and our art making um means that we were ready for uh a really lean moment <laughs> in the general economy um i would also just wanted to name that we took the time to honor our grief mm -hmm. we took the time to um be there for one another and to really be a soft place to land at the end of the really up and down dynamic days that roller coaster days that 2020 um, and now even into 2021 has taken us through. Um, and we literally started to tell at that point in pandemic where 
uh, all the days started to run together. You know, we were all keeping time by SLM Dances Day or not SLM Dances Day. We <laughs> we meet twice a week, and it was like, okay, that's how we're we're t uh, telling time together. And I think for um, you know us, I said to my co leadership, my co leaders we're going to pay people until there's nothing left. You know, I'm not going to end these contracts. I'm not going to um, stop supporting people in their time of need. And I was actually really frustrated at how bigger institutions that had way deeper resources than we did really didn't consider that, or maybe they did and struggled with it. And for me, it's always about the people. So how can I keep supporting my people to the bit to the bitter end you know it is always about the people thank you so much for helping to keep us focused on that sydney all right last up on this first half of our best of 2021 list we have american ballet theater star james whiteside who was actually featured in our very first dance edit extra episode in early september so James came on mostly to discuss his book, Center Center, which is a recounting of his life in and around dance that's inspired by the works of Lewis Carroll and Roald Dahl and David Sedaris. It walks this great line between hysterical and kind of grotesque. Um, but toward the end of the interview, we also talked more about his own artistic explorations of gender and about some of the shifts he's seen happening in the larger ballet world. Here's a part of that discussion. It does seem like there's an evolution happening in ballet where there's a growing movement to rethink the gendered aspects of ballet technique itself. And, and you do have this interesting perspective on all that as someone who is playing with gender in various aspects of your creative life, um, while also playing these hetero princes on stage. Can you talk a little bit more about how you sort of navigate all of that and like how you think about ballet's cultural and technical relationship to gender? I support evolution in art fields. This makes sense. Why would we do the same thing forever? I mm -hmm. also support honoring legacy and uh, the morphing of, of what was always. Um, and for me, I just essentially like to play. So this sort of curiosity serves me quite well because I can express myself and not be ashamed. It's so weird. You know, it, when I first started doing all of these self-expression projects, it was met with wariness and, you know, oh, that's inappropriate. That's strange. But it's, wariness from like your bosses at ballet companies or from, from what direction? From, from peers, friends, patrons, uh, you know, you name it. And it, mm -hmm. was, it was never very direct, but I could feel it. Uh, and then you do something for long enough and it becomes sort of this celebratable thing. It's so weird to me. I'm like, well, where was this 15 years ago? Mm -hmm. You know? Um, so, you know, note to everybody if someone's expressing themselves, don't <laughs> on them. Um, <laughs> pardon my French. <laughs> That's the pull quote. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't really know where ballet is headed, but I do appreciate people's willingness to explore. And I think the more we accept change into our world as ballet dancers, uh, you know, the more relevant our work will be. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not talking about ticking off social issues in a dance. I'm talking about genuine representations of the world we're living in, uh, in beautiful, artful ways. We can do that, and we, we must. That's pretty much the perfect note to end on, I think. And James, we're sending you lots of healing vibes. He suffered a serious knee injury during a Nutcracker performance over the weekend, which of course, he's handling with his typical good humor. He's calling himself the cracked nut, but we hope you can get back to dancing soon. Thanks everyone for joining us for this holiday special. We will be back next week with more of our favorite interview moments from 2021. And in the meantime, keep learning, keep advocating, and keep dancing. Happy holidays, friends.
The Dance Edit Podcast is a product of Dance Media, publisher of Dance Magazine, Dance Spirit, Point, Dance Teacher, Dance Business Weekly, and the Dance Edit Newsletter. Our hosts are Amy Brandt, Courtney Escoyne, Margaret Fuhrer, and Lydia Murray. Our music is by Celestine, with special thanks to Broadway Dance Center for helping us record those footfall sounds. Find out more about the Dance Edit and subscribe to our daily newsletter at thedanceedit.com. Thank you.